Chapter 28 of American History Stories, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2, by Mara L. Pratt. Chapter 28 An Anecdote of Washington. During the Revolution, George Washington was one day riding by a group of soldiers who did not know him. They were busily engaged in raising a beam to the top of some military works. It was a difficult task, and often the corporal's voice could be heard shouting, "'Now you have it! All ready! Pull!' Washington quietly asked the corporal why he didn't turn to and help them. "'Sir,' angrily replied the corporal, "'do you realize that I am the corporal?' Washington politely raised his hat, saying, "'I did not realize it. Beg pardon, Mr. Corporal.' Then dismounting, he himself fell to work and helped the men till the beam was raised. Before leaving, he turned to the corporal, and wiping the perspiration from his face, said, "'If ever you need assistance like this again, call upon Washington, your commander-in-chief, and I will come.' The confused corporal turned red, then white, as he realized that this was Washington himself, to whom he had been so pompous and we hope he learned a lesson of true greatness. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of American History Stories, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2 By Mara L. Pratt Chapter 29 Lydia Dara Saves General Washington At one time, General Washington was very near being attacked by the British army, and his army would very likely have been totally destroyed, had not a brave Quaker woman, Lydia Dara, risked her life to warn him of his danger. One night, one of the British officers who was stationed in her house, ordered her to see that her family were abed and asleep at a certain hour, and to admit General Howe very quietly show him to the officer's apartment, and be ready to let him out just as quietly, when he should be ready to go. Lydia was suspicious. She felt that some treachery was on foot. So when General Howe was safely in his officer's apartment, she took off her shoes, crept softly upstairs, and listened at the keyhole. There she heard them plan to surprise Washington, and take him and his whole army. When she had heard enough, she went trembling to bed, and was apparently so sound asleep that the officer had to knock again and again when he came to rouse her to let General Howe out of the house. Next day, good Mrs. Dara got a pass from General Howe to go to mill and get some flour ground, outside the lines of the army in Philadelphia. Off she walked with a bag of wheat in her arms to the outpost of the Patriot Army, twenty-five miles away. Meeting an officer there, she told her story, and begged the Americans to put Washington at once on his guard. When Howe's army marched toward White Marsh with the greatest secrecy, they found such excellent preparations to receive them, that they turned round and marched back again, without striking a blow. The officer questioned Mrs. Dara. "'Were any of your family awake the night General Howe was here?' "'Not a soul,' she answered." "'Then the walls of this house must have heard our plans,' he said, "'for some one reported them to the rebel Washington. "'When we got to White Marsh, he was all ready for us, "'and we had the pleasure of marching back like a parcel of fools.'" End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 of American History Stories, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2, by Mara L. Pratt, Chapter 30, Washington's Christmas Surprise School in Concert All hail, thou blessed Christmas time, when joy bells ring their merry chime, the time of gifts and sweet surprise, of smiling lips and beaming eyes. Pupil enters and recites the following. Not enough of Christmas joys, without a Christmas story, boys? Methinks I've just the one for you, and what is better still, tis true. Then lend your ears and bright young eyes, while I recount the grand surprise of Washington's long years ago, amid the winter's cold and snow. 
T'was in our country's stern old fight For independence and the right. Within your minds the date well fix, T'was Christmas night of seventy-six. Our army, foot-sore, weary, sad, In numbers few, ill-fed, ill-clad, And fearing much the English foe, Were spending days in want and woe. The Hessian camp was all aglow, And freely there the white wines flow. Their caution on this Christmas night, In revelings had taken flight. To Washington was known the way, The Germans off spent Christmas day, And so, while they were free from cares, He planned to take them unawares. The Delaware between them rolled, The night was stormy, dark, and cold. The floating ice blocked up their way, But on they pressed, and morning gray beheld them on the Trenton side, hard spent, but filled with honest pride. Then on the Hessian camp they fell, a thousand prisoners taken all. With booty, prisoners, and all, they follow at their leader's call. Again they cross the river wide, and reach the Pennsylvania side. Voice A brilliant act, a brilliant thought, and one with mighty issues fraught. And unto Washington so wise, We're debtors for that grand surprise. Voice A record of that daring deed, Just in his country's hour of need, Will ever live in song and fame, While lives the hero's honored name, And memory keeps, in pictures rare, That crossing on the Delaware. All When Christmas fires send out their glow Across the pure, untrodden snow, let thought go back to that far time, When rang the bells no merry chime, But one brave heart, neath wintry skies, Planned out this Christmas Day surprise. Miss Lizzie Stanley End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of American History Stories, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2 by Mara L. Pratt. Chapter 31. Washington's Christmas Gift to the American Army. Washington's army had for some time had nothing but defeat. This, of course, was very encouraging to the British side. There were only about three thousand men with him, and these were suffering from cold and hunger. Washington felt that a bold stroke must be made, and that, too, very soon. He knew that there were encamped just across the Delaware a body of Hessian troops, who had been hired and sent over here by the English government to fight against the colonists. Washington knew the ways of these Hessians, and he was quite sure that they would spend Christmas Day in a great celebration, and very likely would be off guard in the evening. It was a terrible night. The sleet and rain were pouring down. It was bitterly cold, and the river was so full of broken ice, that in the inky darkness it seemed almost impossible to get across. But Washington was brave. His soldiers believed in him, and so they struggled on. It was four o'clock in the morning, when the last boatload of men reached the Trenton shore. They crept silently along the bank, to where the Hessians lay, tired out with Christmas revelry, and thus burst suddenly upon their unsuspecting enemy. It was a glorious victory. Hessians were captured almost before they could rub their eyes open. Washington lost hardly ten men in all, and captured almost one thousand Hessians, besides cannon, guns, and ammunition. The Hessians were sent off for winter quarters into central Pennsylvania, where they found many German settlers, who treated them kindly and spoke their own language. They had a very comfortable time there, and always spoke of Washington as a very good rebel. And so ended with a success at last, the year of 1776, which had for some months looked so dark and dismal to the American army. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 of American History Stories, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2, by Mara L. Pratt, Chapter 32, Valley Forge All through the winter of 1777 and 78, the British and the American armies lay only twenty miles apart. The Redcoats, with their commander, General Howe, were quartered in Philadelphia. 
There they were entertained by the Tories, who gave parties, and balls, and dinners, and did all in their power to make the winter a pleasant one for these British soldiers. Twenty miles away, in a rocky, desolate mountain gorge known as Valley Forge, Washington had led his army from White Marsh. When he went there in bitter December weather, his men, shoeless and almost naked, had marked their way with blood from their bare feet. They reached the valley, and for want of tents were obliged to cut down trees and build huts of logs for shelter from the cold. Congress had no money to pay the men, no money to buy them food. For days and days together, during this winter, they had no bread, and lived upon salt pork alone. They sickened with hunger and cold, and there was no money to buy medicines, no comfortable hospitals where they could be nursed. They were ragged and without shoes. It was a terrible winter for them all. Washington's brave heart ached, and sometimes was very heavy as he saw his men starving and freezing and dying. It seemed almost as if the cause of the colonists must be given up. But you have heard the saying that it is always darkest just before day. And so it proved just now. For in the spring word came from France that aid was to be sent from that country. When the British heard this, they would have been very glad to make peace with the colonists. Indeed, messengers were sent over from England with very liberal offers, offers which, before the war, the colonists would have accepted. But that time was past now. Then these messengers tried to bribe some of the officers in the Patriot Army. One man, General Reed of Pennsylvania, was offered ten thousand guineas and distinguished honors if he would exert his influence to effect a reconciliation. "'I am not worth purchasing,' said the honest patriot. "'But such as I am, the King of Britain is not rich enough to buy me.'" End of chapter 32